So I think I'll stand up for this first um, <coughs> moment, but then I'll sit back down. Um, welcome, everybody. We're delighted that you're here. Uh, it's, a, it's a valuable and important event for us, and I, I hope you find it valuable and important as well. Um, I should announce at the very beginning that one of the announced speakers, um, Lawrence Kermeyer, uh, had an accident just shortly before he came. He's recovering nicely, but he couldn't travel. So I'm substituting for him. That's why I'm up here. Um, so I'm sorry that he can't be here. Uh, he would have had a lot to offer. But that's how things go. Um, so first of all, uh, my name is Jack Petranker. I'm director of the Mangalam Research Center for Buddhist Languages. And um, Mangalam is sponsoring a 10-day summer institute, uh, which has the title, I believe, Putting the Buddhism Science Dialogue on a New Foundation. And we're in the middle of it. We just finished the first half. I believe. And uh, so this is a good time for us to take stock uh, everybody who's on the panel here tonight is participating in the 10-Day Institute. And it's been a very stimulating program. Uh, I think we have the feeling that we're just beginning to engage the issues, but this will be a good chance to, to reflect a little bit on where we stand. Um, Mangalam has as its mission uh, finding ways to bring the teachings of the Buddha into Western languages. And because language, as some people like to say, is, is the house in which we live, the, the, um, the structure within which we find meaning, um, the project of bringing Buddhism into Western languages is also the project of bringing Buddhism into the West. <coughs> so we do a lot of work which is focused more specifically on languages, on terminology, on finding the right vocabulary for translating Buddhist terms, because that's a project that is really in its infancy. Even though uh, West Westerners have been studying Buddhism, scholars have been studying Buddhism for 150 years now, uh, or more, that project is still in its infancy. And we do work on that. We have a, a database program that we work with. We have conferences and seminars and so on. Uh, and we've been doing that since 2010, which is basically when Mangalam started operations. Um, but there's a, a, another broader dimension of what we're doing, which I think is, is really important, and that is to find the right ways to, to activate the dialogue, to really bring Buddhist teachings into a conversation with different dimensions of the West. So science is, is one of those dimensions, if I can use that word. Um, it's, it's one of the ways in which we think about the way things are. And finding a, a conversational mode uh, between Buddhism and science is really important. But we also are looking for other areas of, of mutual inquiry. So what you're seeing here today is, is one step, one moment in an ongoing conversation and process that um, we hope will continue for quite a while to come and will benefit everybody involved. So let me tell you a little bit about, about the, uh, the format here. Um, I'm going to introduce people in just a moment. Uh, just very a very quick introduction, just names really. And uh, then I will start the, uh, the conversation going, um, make a few remarks that are meant to situate the, the, uh, the dialogue, situate this panel. And um, I will take about 10 minutes, and that's what we expect all the panelists to do, to take about 10 minutes or so. And uh, at the end of that time, so it'll be about an hour, and at the end of that time, we'll just throw it open for discussion. So a number of the people who are in the, uh, the Summer Institute are here tonight, and uh, we certainly hope that, uh, that you all will contribute, but we also hope that other people, that all of you will, 
will if you want to join in. Um, we look forward to hearing from you and to having this conversation going. Uh, we are recording the conversation and we'll put it up on the web later on. Um, we're using a, uh, a very sophisticated uh, camera which is recording in 360 degrees, which means you're all on camera uh, all the time, no matter what else is going on. So just be warned. Um, so I think that that's it. Um, and one more thing, when, before I sit down, let me, let me suggest that uh, this, this particular, the theme for this particular panel presentation has to do with different ways of knowing. And so as we start, you might think about your own ways of knowing. What do you bring here? How do you learn? How do you open yourself up to understanding? Uh, I was thinking about this theme just a few minutes ago and I remembered a quote that I've always liked from from uh, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. It's when Brutus, uh, who has killed Caesar, is, is defending himself before the Roman people. And he says, uh, he says, judge me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge. And I've always thought that was really interesting. Uh, he's suggesting a kind of global knowing, a way of opening up to experience. And I think that's a part of what we want to talk about and explore here. So if you just, as, we, as you settle in, let yourself be here. What are your intentions? What are your concerns? What are your interests? What are you feeling? How are you right now? Bring all that here and then listen in that very open, receptive way. And we'll go from there. So as I said, I just want to introduce people by name now so that you, you get the lay of the land. You know who we're talking, who you'll be hearing from. Um, so Francisca Cho, Sean Gallagher, Elena Antonova, Claire petit Manjean, and Martijn van Beek. Um, OK. <laughs> um, and I'll introduce people as, as they start to speak. I'll say just a little bit about their very distinguished backgrounds in each and every case. But first, I'll say something about uh, well, general themes. So, um, over the last 20 years or so, or maybe it's more now, 30 or even 40 years, um, there has been a growing interest in a, a dialogue uh, between Buddhism and science. And uh, Fran is going to say a little more about that. Um, it's an important conversation because in our culture, science is really the highest form of knowing. You know, if science says it's so, then it must be true. I'm not saying that everybody agrees with that or that everybody in this room would agree with that, but that's generally the attitude. Um, so, you know, there used to be these cartoons where, where uh, an alien would land and say, take me to your leader, you know. It's, it's Buddhism coming to the West, it, it's like the people it wants to be taken to, the ones it really wants to be talking to, are in some sense uh, the scientists because they're the ones that everybody else will listen to. So that's, that's a conversation that's been going on. And the question then is how can that conversation take place? What is the, uh, the range of possibilities? And the way that we start off, certainly, in any case, uh, is science takes what you could think of and what many people refer to as a third person view. Um, that is, it looks at things from the outside. The world for science isn't it. Right? It's, it you, so you're, you're the observer, you're looking at what's going on. That's sometimes called the spectator theory of knowledge, or there are many other ways to describe it. Um, so the way that science started looking at Buddhism was in exactly that way. Uh, Buddhism became an object of study. And a lot of that is still true. So there are many aspects of Buddhism you could study, of course, science, and, and we usually think of it in terms of um, the physical sciences. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and in our case, what we're really focusing on now is, is the mind sciences, uh, or maybe I should say, well, we could say the brain sciences, that gets complicated. I'll just say the mind sciences. Um, science has focused very much until now um, on studying Buddhist practices, and in particular meditation. Uh, you could broaden it out a little bit. But what people have really gotten interested in is Buddhist meditation and, and therefore also Buddhist meditators. So um, by studying Buddhist meditators, meditation, uh, scientists have the opportunity to see what kinds of benefits come from practicing meditation. And that's been one of the big areas of interest um, in recent years. Uh, and uh, they have the tools available now. One of the reasons there's been so much interest is that science has developed new tools over the last couple of decades, which really let them see the mind um, in action. Uh, how, how accurate, how, how useful that kind of measurement is, is one of the topics that we've been discussing uh, in, in the Summer Institute, and that may come up again today. But that's generally been the approach that um, that science wants to understand something about meditation, about the impact of meditation, the benefits of meditation, um, and, and what that can teach us about the mind and how it might be useful, uh, whether in a medical sense or otherwise. The, the other possibility uh, that people have been interested in is that science may in some sense validate Buddhism. There's a strong tendency now for people to say, well, we know Buddhism works, we know meditation works, because science has showed that that's the case. And so that also fuels the dialogue in some ways. Uh, there are some problems with that, um, but I don't think I'll go into that right now. Now, there's a broader possibility, one that is hasn't been explored so much, I'd say, but, but people are interested in it, and certainly the people uh, that you'll be hearing from tonight, I think it's fair to say, are, are interested in it. And that is the poss possibility that Buddhist teachings and Buddhist practices can uh, contribute to the scientific understanding of the world, the way that science understands things. Right? Science has a particular version of reality. It tends to think that its version of reality is just the facts, the way things are. But it has its limitations. And it may be that, that Buddhist practice and understanding can in some way um, expand that or modify it, change it, question it. Many possibilities. And people are beginning to uh, explore that. The other possibility that's very much related to that is that um, Buddhism has its own methodology. So met you can think of meditation as a kind of methodology, and that's not the whole of what is available in Buddhism, but it's the part people tend to look at. And uh, that suggests that there may be different ways of knowing the mind. Um, back about 100 years ago, uh, a, a Buddhist an important teacher of Buddhism who did a lot to establish interest in Buddhism, Anagarika Dharmapala, gave a talk at Harvard University that was attended by William James, who was really the father of modern psychology. And um, I've read accounts uh, which say that when, when he was finished, William James stood up and he said, this is the psychology of the future. He was talking about Abhidharma, a particular Buddhist teaching. So that possibility has been there for a long time. Um, but people are interested in exploring it, and we continue to be interested in exploring it. Um, one of the areas of Western thought where that's been a very important element is um, a field of philosophy, you'd usually call it, uh, which is phenomenology. We have several people here on the panel uh, who are interested in phenomenology. Um, phenomenology has to do with appearances, looking really trying to understand how, uh, how the world appears to us and how that happens, that the world appears to us in a certain way. 
So uh, one of the most important figures in phenomenology, Merleau-Ponty, uh, <coughs> said, uh, said the subject is inseparable from the world, which is a kind of a Buddhist thing to say. And then he went on to say, <coughs> is inseparable from the world, but from a world the subject projects. And that is a very Buddhist thing to say. Uh, so there are interesting possibilities for, for dialogue there also. And in the mind sciences in particular, there, there has been a, a move in, in recent uh, years to, to look, to, to really move away from the kind of spectator theory of knowledge that I talked about before uh, and say that, that knowledge is, um, is something that happens in the world, in our engagement with the world. It's embodied, it's embedded, it arises through our actions in the world. And um, all of that provides some very interesting ways of thinking about uh, how Buddhism could contribute to some of the really interesting uh, developments, ways of thinking, ways of knowing that have been emerging in, uh, in science. Uh, and so those are the, the possibilities for dialogue. Now, as this institute has been going on over the last five days or so, um, I've been thinking more and more about something that's just a little different from that, and I want to share that because it seems to me important to, to, to make this a, a, a kind of a living inquiry, right? I, so I'm just going to let you know what's on my mind. And, and that is that uh, we've been talking a fair amount about um, the way that Buddhist practitioners practice, what it means to be a practicing Buddhist. And at the same time, we've, we've begun to ask questions about how it is that scientists practice. What does it mean to be a practicing scientist? Not just what methods do you use, but, but um, what is it like to engage the world uh, as a scientist um, so that that's a living reality? And I think that that's, to me, that seems like a very interesting question. And that might be the place that, um, that it really becomes possible to think about a different kind of science, a science that is at least influenced by Buddhism. There are some important differences, the approaches, the methodologies that Buddhism and science have to offer and that they rely on are very different. But there are also commonalities, and that's what I hope we'll be able to explore. So I think that's basically what I have to say. Um, so let me move on and introduce first Fran Cho. So we'll go right down the road here. So um, Fran is a professor of Buddhist studies at Georgetown University. Um, she. Uh, a couple of years ago, well, in 2016, she published a book called Religion and Science in the Mirror of Buddhism. So you can see we have the right people up here. Uh, she also, even more recently, published a book uh, called Seeing Like the Buddha, Enlightenment Through Film. And um, I want to talk more with you about that, Fran, because I think that would be an interesting topic, too, to, to investigate. Uh, her work concerns uh, Buddhist theories of the imagination and, and how that applies to, uh, to the world that we inhabit here, today and here. And she's interested also in questions of methodology uh, and uh, in systems thinking, which I haven't heard anything about from you yet, but we have time. Okay, so, Fran. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. What I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes is represent the perspective mm -hmm. of the academic um, scholar uh, of Buddhism and then conclude with maybe some of my own uh, individual views. So starting more generally with how scholars of Buddhism, and not, I mean mostly Western uh, educated PhDs, you know, teaching at uh, Western universities, are looking at this dialogue between Buddhism and science, I would say that there is uh, a healthy dose of skepticism 
and concern uh, about this confluence. And it's a useful skepticism because, you know, as scholars, we take uh, historical consciousness as something that's very important. And many of you might be engaged, you know, as modern Western Buddhist practitioners. And it's, it's good to know the history of that tradition uh, with which you're personally engaged. And so coming from that perspective, um, what the scholar of Buddhism will often point out is that this dialogue between Buddhism and science did not arise just naturally and spontaneously. It has a history that we should pay attention to. Buddhism became the object of European consciousness um, roughly in the mid-19th century. And what, what was going on in terms of global geopolitics then? Why was there this encounter with Asian culture and societies and religions at all? It was colonialism. It was a context of very unequal power relations. And as a result, uh, uh, so you, you had the, the colonial military um, complex, if you will, and in tandem with that, you had Christian missionaries spreading out uh, throughout Asia. And um, some of that rhetoric entailed the argument that the indigenous religions, Buddhism included, was superstitious, idolatrous, backwards, medieval, and something that ought to be replaced by Christianity. So you had Asian Buddhists faced with the situation of peril, basically. And they responded, and this is interesting, this is cuts across Asia, uh, you know, from Sri Lanka to China, Japan. Um, they responded by saying, hey, look, going back to Jack's point about the epistemic authority of science in the West, right? Science has the greatest authority. So the, the Buddhists pointed out, Buddhism is a lot more like science, harmonious with, harmonious with science, than Christian dogma is, right? So it was like this reverse power play, if you want. And that led to this, you know, on both sides, you had Western intellectuals very enthusiastic about the possibility of Buddhism. And what else is going on uh, in, in Western um, European and American society at this point? The loss of faith, loss of Christian faith in the wake of the scientific rationalist critique. So they're looking for alternative possibilities, alternative spiritualities, if you, uh, if you will. And a lot of people thought they founded in Buddhism. OK, so I mean, what's wrong with this? Nothing. But I think what the scholar of Buddhism wants to point out is because of this historical context, the focus on Buddhism as a scientific religion, or at least a tradition very harmonious with science, is a very filtered, right? selective representation of Buddhism that privileges certain aspects of it. It's very philosophical, contemplative, and the even logical side, but completely dismisses, or at the very least overlooks, other aspects of Buddhism that looks a lot more like traditional religion, the kind that Western intellectuals and the educated don't want, right? So uh, many are not interested in Buddhist ritual, Buddhist mythology, and cosmology. So this gets dismissed. And the scholar of Buddhism is very much attached to, you know, I don't know if it makes them suffer, but they are attached to traditional forms of Buddhism. And uh, when it comes to, say, Tibetan Buddhism, many scholars of Tibet, they're very much concerned that this is a vanishing culture, a culture and tradition that is under political threat. And I think their impulse is to want to preserve the totality, the richness of Buddhist tradition. All right. So this is uh, the concern. Um, uh, and that also entails putting, Bud putting Buddhist practice and belief under the epistemic authority and evaluation of science. Science is given the authority to say Buddhist meditation works, but Buddhist cosmology, well, that's a bunch of hooey. We'll, we'll throw that out. But we'll keep the parts, you know, 
that are beneficial. So I, I think that is a good thing to keep in mind that, um, you know, we are selecting the parts that we like, the parts that seem to speak to us, and sort of, um, if not denigrating, sort of trivializing the other parts that seem to us uh, resonant of the usual hocus pocus uh, of religion, uh, superstition or mythology, magic, and, and, and institutions and rituals and so forth. But um, let me move to uh, a, a more positive narrative because uh, I function I think primarily as a cultural observer, and I'm fascinated by this process of Buddhist tradition coming into contact with Western society, which is utterly different. I mean, there's just so much difference between the two. And I want to say this is not only a fascinating process to watch, but first, hey, you can't expect the wholesale importation of this entirely different, you know, and in and of itself vast and heterogeneous tradition to be imported wholesale into the West. I mean, Buddhism was never imported wholesale in its prior form into a new culture. So take, for example, the transmission of Buddhism into China. Okay, so it's not at all a surprise uh, that in the modern West, there are selective uh, interests to uh, or focus on Buddhist tradition. And I think that could be good, mutually beneficial. Uh, Buddhism teaches everything changes, right? So its own continuity is going to be the result of development, change, evolution in new contexts. And so in terms of the dialogue with science, what I see uh, as a positive development that people are genuinely looking for, scientists and other perhaps agnostic, atheistic, or generally disenchanted with institutional religion types, is the option of, of being rationalists but not in this mode that you know we, we get the impression in our culture that if you adhere to science, that you have to be a materialist, that you have to be a reductivist, that you have to believe that all that matters is you know, the laws of nature and spirituality and mental, uh, I don't want to say mental health, but um, um, uh, uh, qualities or experiences don't matter. And so what I see is because Buddhism does have resonances with scientific thinking and scientific values, but on the other hand, it is an ethical tradition. It is a tradition of contemplation and cultivation. This confluence of qualities, I think, gives scientists and atheists, agnostics, what have you, a space where they can bring these values together. Uh, so you can see that, as Jack mentioned, in the interest uh, among certain scientists of taking personal first-person experience and reportage seriously, rather than being limited to third-person uh, reportage. And recently, um, I wrote an article about, uh, so I was looking at conversations within epigenetics, quantum physics, and neuroscience. The, the three sciences that are prone to reductionism. Neuroscientists could say that mind is nothing but neurons, or that life is nothing but genes, or that um, you know, the universe is nothing but particles or matter. And those who turn to an interest in Buddhism do so because they're given resources to get beyond this potential reductionism to talk about how mental intentionality and experience has an impact at the epigenetic level or at the quantum level and certainly at the neurological level, especially this talk of top-down causality. Um, and they, they take the resources from their own internal scientific developments but also from their exposure to Buddhist philosophy uh, so that within science and scientific discourse, you carve out a space for talking about things like 
human experience and human values. So I, I, I think, you know, in my mind, that, that is a very positive development which is meaningful uh, to, to Western society at large. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. So next we have Sean Gallagher. Sean is the Lillian and Maury Moss Professor of Excellence in Philosophy, I like that very much, <laughs> at, at, at the University of Memphis. Um, his, uh, his area of research is, is primarily phenomenology and the cognitive sciences. Um, I won't spell it out too much more than that. Um, Sean is, is, he has a secondary research appointment at the University of Wollongong in Australia. Uh, and he's also honorary professor at the University of Tromso in Norway. Uh, he was previously honorary professor at the University of Copenhagen and Durham University, which is in England. So you can see he likes to travel. Um, he's he's um, a founding editor and the co-editor-in-chief of a journal that's very important in these fields called Phenomenology and the Cognitive Sciences and uh, has written a book called The Phenomenological Mind. So you can see we're moving, <laughs> you can tell, we're moving into the field of phenomenology here. Um, he uh, has a new book coming out, if they're on schedule, it'll be out next month, called An Activist Interventions, Rethinking the Mind. Okay, thank you, Jack. And uh, I'm glad to see there's so much interest in this uh, topic here. So uh, picking up on uh, uh, some things that uh, Fran Francisca has uh, said about first-person um, experience and uh, the question of how does science go about studying first-person experience, uh, where first-person experience just means my experience as I experience it, or your experience as you experience it. How do I get to that if I'm a scientist? Um, and uh, the uh, at least one uh, approach uh, that studies first-person experience is, in fact, phenomenology. Uh, Jack has said a little bit about that. So I take uh, phenomenology uh, to, uh, to start in a, a, a set of philosophers for, uh, in Europe, um, in Germany. Uh, Edmund Husserl uh, is uh, perhaps the, the one who started this going. Um, uh, Heidegger also, Merleau-Ponty, uh, Jack mentioned. Uh, but also, uh, it comes uh, into the United States uh, pretty quickly, actually, in the 30s and 40s. Uh, and you might be familiar with Hubert Dreyfus, who uh, taught here uh, at Berkeley for quite a while. And he was a very well-known uh, phenomenologist. And uh, he just died very recently. Um, another person who was very much influenced by Merleau-Ponty's work uh, is Francisco Varela. Um, and he... Uh, is someone also who uh, was instrumental in starting the Mind and Life Institute uh, with the Dalai Lama. Uh, so that uh, he is one of the people who really, uh, in, in the most recent uh, interest in the connection between science and Buddhism, uh, Francisco Varela was one of, one of the, uh, the pe important people who, who really got us started uh, um, setting up meetings with the Dalai Lama uh, between Dalai Lama and, and scientists and so forth. Um, Varela was a, a neurobiologist. Uh, he worked in the area of cognitive science, um, but he was also very much influenced, as I said, by phenomenology and especially the phenomenology of Merleau-Ponty. So Merleau-Ponty brings uh, this idea that experience, our experience, is not just something going on in our head, but rather it's embodied. It's something that involves the body, and the body is in the world, in the environment. And so we have to study um, the, uh, the, uh, the idea of consciousness or cognition from a more holistic perspective. Uh, and that's uh, uh, at least one thing that phenomenology uh, is attempting to contribute to, this, this kind of an activist approach, to an embodied and activist approach to uh, understanding cognition. So the one thing, um, one thing that I'm interested in uh, is a notion in phenomenology which uh, is referred to as pre-reflective self-awareness. And um, pre-reflective self-awareness is in contrast to a more reflective 
self-awareness or uh, self-consciousness where, for example, in reflection, I, I can, uh, in my thought, I can reflect on my own experience and take that experience uh, as an object and, and look and examine. Some people refer to that as introspection. Pre-reflective experience uh, is, is not reflective in that sense. Uh, it's part of the very structure of consciousness. It's part of what it means to be a subject who experiences the world. So that when I'm engaged in an action in the world, uh, if I'm reaching to, to grasp uh, a bottle or in some more complex type of project, uh, well, I would, I would, I think, normally say that I'm aware of what I'm doing. Uh, and that awareness is something that seems to be built into experience itself. It's not something that I have to stop and reflect upon in order to figure out what I'm doing. It's rather something that is part of the very experience of my doing whatever it is I'm doing. Um, so it gives you, a, a, the phenomenologist claims, it gives you a sense of mindness. It gives you a sense of self uh, in, in this kind of very minimal a uh, thin sense of uh, self-awareness. Now, I think this is uh, interesting to think about in the context of uh, talking about mindfulness. So this term mindfulness, I'm learning in, in this institute, and I've, uh, I've been aware of this uh, uh, for a while, but I, I'm learning in much more detail, <coughs> this notion of mindfulness. <clears throat> um, of course, we can think of it as uh, a kind of Buddhist concept uh, attached to uh, the notion of meditation. So you have the notion of mindfulness meditation. But the notion of mindfulness itself uh, is <clears throat> in dispute, let's say. Uh, there's not 100% agreement among all Buddhists or among all people who think about uh, the notion of mind mindfulness, exactly what it means. Um, but it has become uh, somewhat popular to talk about mindfulness, uh, not just in terms of Buddhist meditation, uh, but in terms of other kinds of practices, bodily practices, and uh, kind of uh, mind practices. Uh, so the idea of being mindful of one's posture, for example, might be part of uh, what some people practice uh, called Alexander Technique, uh, which is sometimes used in the performing arts. Uh, but also in yoga, in Tai Chi, those types of things, of course. But also you find um, uh, people who are... Uh, athletic performers talking about mindfulness. You find dancers and musical performers talking about mindfulness as well. So the question is, what exactly is this mindfulness, and how do you characterize it, especially in a performance, uh, if, especially if you are in the flow of a performance. Let's say if you are uh, a musical performer and you are playing your instrument and you're you're really into it and in the flow. Well, um, it turns out that uh, some phenomenologists think that when you go into that kind of flow experience, it's really a kind of mindless experience. In fact, Hubert Dreyfus argued uh, for that type of idea. But uh, other phenomenologists, and there have been phenomenological studies, uh, that actually suggest hmm, there's something more going on there. It's not, it's not just that we sort of lose all sense of self uh, or all sense of, uh, uh, of uh, what we're doing when we're in the flow, but in fact, there's a number of variations of um, awareness of what we're doing. This is not the same as a reflective awareness, that is to say, when I'm in the flow of a performance, I'm not <laughs> reflectively thinking about what I'm doing, necessarily. Uh, and it might be a little bit more, however, than a pre-reflective awareness that we normally are engaged in. So athletic uh, performers, uh, dance performers, music performance actually report um, that they have a certain kind of awareness that is, they sometimes re refer to it as a kind of being mindful uh, of what they're doing in the performance, and uh, that this is something more than just a minimal uh, type of awareness, uh, as one would find in pre-reflective awareness. So now the question is, what sort of methods could we use in order to, to get to that, uh, in order to study something like mindful awareness? Um, 
And uh, one, of course, uh, could do first-person phenomenology and just be a performer and then consult one's own experience. One could do a kind of second-person phenomenology, and we'll hear more about that from, from Claire. Uh, one could uh, incorporate a kind of phenomenology into uh, a neuroscientific study. So Francisco Varela talked about this under the heading of neurophenomenology. And uh, a number of people have done those kinds of studies. And uh, specifically, I, uh, I'm interested in a set of studies, uh, recent studies, uh, of meditation where meditators who have quite um, an expertise in meditation, they've been practicing for many, many years, uh, they uh, come into the lab and they can put themselves into meditation states. And some of these meditation states are uh, described as non-dual states or selfless states. Non-dual meaning that there's no distinction between self and everything else. Uh, and the self in a certain way disappears. So now the question is, if, if you are uh, a meditator uh, with such expertise that you can enter into one of these uh, non-dual or selfless states, can you report about those selfless states? And that seems problematic in the sense that if, if it's truly selfless, then you would want to say, well, there's nobody there to witness it. Uh, and when I come out of it, it might be more like <coughs> waking up and saying, what happened? Um, or uh, is there, in fact, something like a minimal pre-reflective self-awareness still sort of implicit there in experience um, that characterizes in some way that selfless state, in which case it's not entirely selfless. But that, that is a, an issue, a kind of problem that I'm interested in, in looking at. And, and there's been a number of studies, I, I won't uh, specify them, but uh, they have put yeah, uh, experienced meditators in these states and then they've conducted interviews afterwards trying to get a sense of what that state is like and they get rich descriptions. And the question is, how is that possible? So that's the kind of puzzle I've been thinking about. Good. I'll turn you over now to a neuroscientist. Yeah. Or Jack will introduce. <laughs> right. Um, yes, we have one real neuroscientist on the panel. <laughs> Elena Antonova. Um, she's a lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience at King's College in London. And her main research interest is the neuroscience of mindfulness. Uh, she uses psychophysiology and neuroimaging methods, working with, I imagine, the kind of long-term mindfulness practitioners that Sean was describing, right? Um, mainly from the Tibetan Buddhist traditions of Dzogchen and Mahamudra, which some of you will know something about. Um, OK, Elena. Thank you. Oh, what just happened? Um, these are not really very exciting slides. They're more the prompts to, uh, for me to, to be coherent. <laughs> um, although I live in London, um, I grew up in Russia. And if any of you ever traveled to Russia, uh, you might have been engaged without your consent into a contest of being drunk under the table with a bottle of vodka <laughs> in the middle. So I'm kind of so feeling that way now. I, my colleagues here drank me under the table <laughs> with a conceptual discourse. So I apologize if I'm not as coherent as I usually will be. Um, so um, I mean, in many ways, I'm a very um, a typical scientist to be put on, on the seat to defend science. I even talk um, of science as a way of knowing um, because I have been practicing Buddhism for quite a long time and I'm a Dzogchen practitioner for, for those of you who, who know the, the school of thought and the school of practices. And I also been uh, radicalized by Varela's view <laughs> of um, 
how science should be transformed and what science is and what it isn't. So um, I, in many ways, forgot the symptoms of the disease <laughs> um, in order to kind of sedate them. Um, but we all have our view of what science is, how it communicates to us, particularly through media, uh, the kind of facts and truths and obj objectifications that are put forth. So I'm going just to touch on some of those. And first thing I would like to do is to differentiate between science and scientism. And science, in its broader definition, and we had a very, very rich day today touching on the, um, science as uh, a broad sense of knowledge. Um, and under this definition of science, all branches of knowledge can be considered as science, as a way of accessing knowledge. And that includes philosophy, history, theology, mathematics, anthropology, any other um, engagement of the experience through which we get to know, from which, which create the sense of knowing. Um, and in many aspects of knowing, there is no contradiction between knowing and being. Um, but the way science has evolved and the criteria of science have evolved has introduced this contradiction between knowledge and knowing and being. Um, so science is then limited to knowledge of the physical cosmos as observed empirically and objectively. And this word objectively also has multiple aspects to it, which I'm going to touch on a little bit later. So this narrowing of the usage could be traced back to, well, back to Aristotle who distinguished between uh, physics um, as a study of nature versus mathematics, which is more sort of um, 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 science of ideals or ideals of thought. Um, but in the medieval, medieval times, the sort of the rise of natural philosophy, um, <coughs> it's really meant wisdom to be learned from nature. And uh, Francisco made a very um, eloquent presentation today um, whereby we kind of, we know from Buddhism, uh, this uh, discourse um, about conventional truth versus absolute truth, relative truth versus absolute truth. Um, and in many ways, science studies what we consider to be conventional truth, how things in the, in the causal uh, world that we observe with our senses, you know, what, what are the mechanism of inter interdependent arising but of course, science loses the bigger picture that Buddhism maintains when it thinks about conventional truths as nested within a broader understanding bro that, that is, um, reconciles all, all the kind of contradictions and limitations of, con uh, of conventional truth by resting in the absolute truth, right? So, um, and um, scientists generally not aware <laughs> of this, um, idea um, of, of, of this limitation um, and in, instead of some knowledge of a, um, absolute truth as taught in Buddhism, we, we rest on absolute foundations that tend to be kind of reductionist ontologies and of course our predominant one is the materialist one. Um, and that leads me to science versus scientism. Um, and according to one definition sort of given by John Coburn in scientism, a world we need, and this is not kind of a critique of scientism, this is a defense of scientism. Uh, scientism is a worldview where only scientific knowledge is valid, that science can explain and do everything, and that nothing else can explain or do anything. <laughs> it is the belief that science and reason or scientific and rational are coextensive in terms. And of course, we're all familiar with that uh, sense of science and doing science and reporting science. So scientism um, is therefore dogmatic ideology, which presumes that science, in the narrow sense of the word, has 
or will have the answers to all questions. Um, and as a neuroscientist, of course, you know, um, majority of my colleagues think that by studying the brain, they will explain the mind. Um, and so Jack, um, uh, in his introduction, he put study of the brain, a study of the mind, and, and I, would, I would immediately dissociate myself from that claim and say, no, study of the brain is the study of the brain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the study of neuroscience is the study of the um, interactions and biological organism and the nervous system. Um, it will never tell us anything about the mind. It can only give us neural level description of what happens, which we may or may not be able to pair up in some correlative way with subjective experiences. Um, so yes, so kind of um, hammering the point of scientism um, as a critique of it now that claims of metaphysics are invalid or religious uh, ways of knowing are invalid ways of knowing and have no bearing on reality because physical cosmos is all there is and therefore it's the only thing we're studying. Now, even if we take science in its narrow modern sense, in many ways, uh, it's a, a pure ideology aspires to, to pure knowledge, to acquire pure knowledge that is free of personal biases, uh, prejudices, beliefs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. cultural indoctrinations. That's sort of one of the notions of objectivity in science is to be able to achieve that third person knowledge by a scientist adopting a third person stance. Um, and this is objective knowledge that is attained and confirmed by the neutral observers. But who is this third person? You know, really. So the, this sort of criteria for this third person is, in my view, it's unachievable because this third person is the neutral and objective observer who's disembodied and decontextualized. The reality is that the third person, i.e. scientist making an observation, is simultaneously a first person having an experience, right? When I'm as a neuroscientist, take my fMRI scanner and I put someone into it and I look at the, you know, whatever I look at, the, 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 the maps, brain maps produced in all sorts of artificial ways um, that have no bearing on actual neural activity, <laughs> what, I, what I'm engaging is, is is interpretive activity. You know, I'm, I'm a person having an experience of scanning and looking at the data and making an interpretation of what I see. There is very little there to meet the criterion of objectivity, right? And of course, I'm not the first one to point this out. I'm just bringing this um, into the uh, discourse. So the, the best objectivity that is achievable is intersubjective agreement. The agreement of first persons, scientists, that a certain aspect of experience, I looking at a brain through fMRI scanner under certain conditions, is shared and reproducible. And um, Sean already mentioned Francisco Varela, who uh, was very much influenced by phenomenology, but also he was a practicing Buddhist. So he was also very deeply influenced, touched, and transformed. And, and he, one of his um, missions, not the right word, but one of his drives through his personal transformation and being touched by uh, Majamika philosophy um, was to bring this understanding from Majamika and phenomenology of his soul and all of NT into science, inject science with that same transformational understanding that he was touched by. And so I have these quotes from him that touch on objectivity in regard to scientists as an observer, as, sort of, uh, as a third person knowledge generator, that all knowledge necessarily emerges from our lived experience, that every examination is an interpretation. Uh, but I also bring a quote here from Werner Heisenberg to bring on the notion that we can even study objectively the nature by the apparatus that we have or methods that we have. Um, and we said that, uh, he said that what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. 
So sci scientific knowledge in that sense is objectified, not objective. And what I mean by that, um, I use objectified in the sense of, you know, one of the definitions is to, to objectify is to bring idea into form, right? So uh, science is a hypo hypothesis testing. And what is hypothesis testing? It's an idea born out of the set of ideas, right? I, conceptual framework. Um, form is the data produced as a result of observation, manipulation, measurement, using all sorts of scientific instruments. But then my interpretation as a scientist of that form that I have generated actually delivers this form back into the realm of ideas, right? And that's where it should stay. You know, I objectify it and I release back into the ideas. But of course, what we do as scientists and the society as a whole <laughs> is that we reify it into objective knowledge. How am I doing in time? You could finish off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> am I over 10 minutes? Um, yeah, I think so. I haven't okay, uh, very briefly then. So just touching on this, uh, you know, pervasive notion that plagues our society and media reporting of science is that science as, as, as a generator of facts and truth. Um, but for scientists, really, if, if a data, uh, if and when, and when is very, very rare, it's more, or more if data are replicated, the evidence base accumulates. Um, there are no truths. There is evidence base that serves as means for applications, you know, clinical, educational, technological. Um, and physical science, as we all know, has been enormously successful in translating into iPhones and iPads and all sorts of other technologies. But, um, Fran Francesca has emphasized this point today, and uh, if something works, it doesn't make it true or objectively existing. And again, this is something that we forget as scientists and also it's our, our common human propensity. Um, and so the, the, the remedy that uh, Francisco Varela um, in his book, Embodied Mind, with his colleagues Evan Thompson um, and um, Eleanor Roche have uh, brought into um, the, the kind of the focus by looking at groundlessness in Buddhism, Western philosophy and biology is this emphasis on uh, experiential, um, um, well, in Buddhism, groundless, groundlessness means that phenomena, whether mental or physical, in appearance, lack inherent and independent existence, right? In Western philosophy, groundlessness means that knowledge and meaning lack any absolute foundation, such as God um, or any other source. And as uh, already been mentioned both, both by Jack and uh, Sean, this sort of um, inactivism and embodied approach, which is actually has taken a lot of traction in biology and cognitive sciences, which um, inactivism was coined by Francisco Varela, who was influenced by phenomenology and Buddhism. So this idea is kind of coalesce and really Groundlessness, in my view, is the only way the practice of groundlessness for us as individuals, whether we're scientists or Buddhist practitioners or whatever we do in life, this practice of groundlessness is the only way to dissolve the discrepancy between scientific knowledge and lived experience. So in, if we continue to fall into a habitual tendency to reify the dual rather than dualistic aspect of our experience, thoughts versus objects out there into a separate self and independent world, the practice of groundlessness is thus necessary for us to bring knowing and being um, into unity in whatever we do, science included. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Claire Petit-Mangin. You've already heard Francisco Varela's name a great deal. Um, Claire um, completed her PhD thesis under his supervision, so um, she's a good representative to speak uh, to us tonight. Uh, she studied with him at the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and um, she then did, in, in Europe they do what is essentially a second PhD in habilitation. Uh, she did that in philosophy. She's um, Professor Emerita at the Institut Mines Telecom 
and a member of the Husserl Archives in Paris. Uh, she, uh, she focuses in her research on the dynamics of lived experience, and she's been taking this practice of phenomenology uh, in a specific direction that she and some of her colleagues have developed, um, which she calls microphenomenology, as a way of really engaging our experience in a very uh, precise and clear way. Thank you, Jack. So I would like to say a few words about microphenomenology. It's a method of interview which was in initially uh, created in France for the transfer of expertise. Is it okay? Expertise transfer. Mm -hmm. And has been adapted to cognitive science on the instigation of Francisco Varela. And this method enables the interviewed person to become aware of unnoticed dimensions of moments of experience or pre-reflective, as, uh, as sh shown uh, said, pre-reflective or unnoticed dimensions of moments of experience and to describe them with an unusual, very fine grain level. I, I hypothesis that this method could play an important role in the dialogue between Buddhism and science, and I will explain why. So many scientific studies are indeed condu conducted on the neurophysiological effects of meditation practice and on the neur neural correlates of meditative states. But very few studies have been conducted on the experience associated with contemplative practice. Finally, what is it like to meditate from instant to instant at different stages of the practice? This remains a more almost invisible in contemporary contemplative science. This lack of knowledge of meditative practice seems to hamper the understanding of both the effects of practice and its correlates. Its effects, because only fine-grained description of the experience of the practitioner would enable us to understand the processes that are mobilized during meditation that may help to explain such effects. It correlates because the more the neuroimaging techniques are refined, the finer the level of granularity of description of the corresponding experience needs to, to enable the cognitive neuroscientist to make sense of brain activity. Moreover, maybe more, even more important, by focusing on the effects and correlates of meditation. Scientific studies seem to forget the essence, the very purpose of this practice, which is to learn to see things as they are, or to see what is there. What does this consist in? What does the meditator experience as the different stages of this training? So to answer this question, there is no other way than asking him what happens to him. But even for advanced meditative practitioners who are supposed to be acutely aware of their, their experience, this is not easy to describe very precisely what they do when they practice. Let me, let me take an example. A very widespread meditative technique, shamatha, consists in focusing your attention on your breathing. And each time you re realize that your attention has drifted, to come back to your breathing. Easy to describe, isn't it? But what does it mean, for example, to focus your attention on your breathing? What do you do exactly to focus your attention? When you focus your attention, what do you focus? Where does this focusing occur? Does this focusing in only involve a felt dimension or also a visual dimension, or possibly an auditory dimension? Another question. Once your attention is focused, how do you know that it is focused? Do you do 
anything to sustain this focusing. After a while, which may be very short, a very amazing phenomenon probably occurs. <laughs> a virtual scene emerges in your experience that becomes more vivid than the current situa situation it is. So vivid that you completely forget that you were supposed to focus your attention on your breathing. <laughs> For example, you imagine that you are wa walking on the beach and you forget your, your breathing. You can do this right now. Take your time to imagine that you are walking on the beach. You can. Now, silently answer a few questions. Did the scene you have just imagined appear instantaneously or progressively? In the latter case, if it appeared progressively, which sensorial dimension appeared first? The visual, the tactile, the auditory, the olfactory? While you were imagining this scene, were you still aware of your visual, auditory, bodily sensations here? Or did you at least par partly lose contact with some of them So you are walking on the beach, and after a while that may be long, you realize that your attention has drifted and that, and that your attention has left your breathing and that you are not there anymore, meditating. What makes you realize that? Does this realization occur randomly? Or do subtle cues draw your attention towards the fact that your attention as a drifter. When you realize that, how do you, do you leave the beach? Does the scene disappear instantaneously or progress, progressively? Do certain sensations persist more than others? Which sensation from the current situation come back first? the visual, the auditory, the tactile. Finally, what do you do to come back to your breathing? How do you manage coming back? How does this act consist in? So these questions are examples of the type of questioning we use in the micro-phenomenological interview method. Questions which are non as, as non-inductive as possible, such as, when you do that, what do you do? When you focus your attention, what, what do you do? So it's not really difficult to, to, to do less inductive, but at the same time, very focused, very directive in a way. So in the context of a project founded, founded sorry for my accent, for, by the Mind and Life Institute, I, I hope you understand me. <laughs> So the, the Feno pilot project, Martin, me, and a few other, other people, we used this, this method to help meditator, meditation practitioners from five to 45 years of experience describe more moments of meditative experience. At, at the end, all of them agreed that interviews help them to become aware of sub, subtle feelings and subtle micro gestures they had not noticed before, which in turn helps them to perform these gestures more accurately and provide, provide them with more clarity in their practice. Meditation instructors, because some of them was, were also meditation instructors, they testified that these interviews also were also useful for them. On the, the one hand, a more refined awareness of their own, own practice helps them to refine their meditation instructions. On the other hand, microphenomenological interviews help them to develop a richer palette of instructions that are more pre precisely adapted to each student and to the specific difficulties they meet. 
The pilot study also suggests a hypothesis to explain the discomfort often generate, generated by attentional drift as well as the therapeutic effect of meditation. It suggests that this discomfort is not, or at least not only due to the pleasant or unpleasant content of the virtual scene, but to the very loss of contact with the intimacy of experience, notably bodily experience. In this view, the therapeutic effect of medita meditation is not explained, it's only a, a partial explanation, but it's not explained by a particular experiential content, a particular state, but by the very process of re regaining contact with experience, regardless of its content. It would be very valuable to deepen the description of this process of loss of contact with experience, which prevents us from seeing things as they are, and is considered in the, in the Buddhist tradition as the very root of suffering. And it, it, it would be also very valuable, of course, um, to describe precisely the reverse process of coming into contact with experience. The, the, this pilot study also suggests that at a, a certain level of detail, the meditative acts have a structure. They are not just random. That they have a precise structure that can be described precisely. To conclude, this finding, this finding suggests that we are progressing towards a disciplined, rigorous study of lived experience, that it is possible, it's not a phantasm. <laughs> In other words, we are progressing towards a science which is, which is not based on the exclusion of lived experience anymore, but in which the study of experience plays a central role. My hypothesis is that it is at least, sorry, at this level that Buddhism and science can meet. A science integrating a disciplined description of lived experience at a microdynamic level, a level that meditation techniques ca can enable us to become aware of. Thank you. Very good. And our last speaker is Martijn von Beek, who uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and at the Interacting Minds Center at Aarhus University in Denmark. Um, Martijn has spent a good deal of time living in Tibetan Buddhist communities, especially in Ladakh. Uh, and he's been doing research on contemplative practices lineages and communities in the contemporary world in the West as well as in Asia. Uh, and he, uh, he lives in a contemplative community in Denmark. Thank you, Jack. Um, <clears throat> I'll just move the microphone a bit. So um, I'm an anthropologist, and um, anthropologists like to claim that they uh, do everything. You know, they're we're like more holistic than everybody else who's saying they're holistic. <laughs> and, and as Claire just said, I've been involved in, in this microphenomenological type research where we're, you know, we're talking to people about moments of experience and we talk about one particular moment maybe for two hours. And we could continue for another you know, five hours and still not have exhausted this one moment of experience. There are so many things to talk about. At the same time, uh, my training is, uh, among other things, in in development studies, um, where we look at global political economic processes. And for me, those things are connected. So what I want to do is, is sketch out this field of uh, contemplative studies, the, the encounter between Buddhist practice and scientific research, by taking as a point of departure um, the state of the world. I'll, I'll be very brief, because we all know how it is. <laughs> but <clears throat> I just flew in from Denmark uh, six days ago now. 
And, uh, and one of the things that strikes me uh, every time I come to the US, but particularly this time here in Berkeley, where I haven't been in for 20 years, um, is all the homeless people. Yeah. And the, the number of people with mental illnesses that you see on the street, and the amount of suffering that you encounter at the same time that you see the Mercedes and the Porsches and so on driving around. Of course, in Denmark, which is often seen as a you know Scandinavia example, for, you know welfare state. Every, you know, this is how America should be, at least if you're liberal in Berkeley. That's maybe your model. Um, what we have is we've sent ships to the Mediterranean to stop migrants from reaching the shores of Europe, and uh, there is some fantastic, disturbing footage on the internet. Uh, for example, by a Danish journalist who was wearing a GoPro camera as they were sailing on the Mediterranean and they come across a, a, a boat of refugees that have uh, taken water and people are in the water and he's, he's filming as they're trying to rescue people and you actually see people you know, drowning and, um, in this beautiful, uh, tranquil blue sea with a perfectly blue sky and no cloud in the sky and you just hear the sounds of the people and just this eerie kind of surrealist uh, uh, feeling around it. So what we have is a world of pain <laughs> and suffering. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm smiling. But it's, it's really... Um, but there, the, the, the point I want to make is we encounter suffering in many different ways in our daily lives. And of course we all know that also in Scandinavia, in Denmark, the percentage of children that are on psychopharmaca to try and help them overcome ADHD um, you know, our students come in now with uh, levels of stress. Uh, you know, they all have a high, almost all of them have a, a diagnosis of some sort. So, th so, so even in the most privileged parts of the world, we maybe meet different kinds of suffering, but there is suffering there. And so, the, the whole project for me is about: is there something in the wisdom traditions? that we might use that helps us to see the world more as it is and see solutions to some of these problems in a more uh, real sense, in a more fundamental sense. And so for me, the, the, the real work is in trying to recover, trying to begin to understand more deeply what contemplative traditions actually are, not in theory, but in practice. And we have a, and the way that this has been, you know, John Kabat-Zinn uh, is one of the people that has really been working in this field and is reaching millions of people by secularizing, by simplifying, by taking it out of context and doing all the things that Buddhists, I am myself uh, <laughs> practicing Buddhist, um, often feel that it's something we should criticize because it's dangerous. I'm not denying that there are dangers, but it is also doing a lot of good in the world. But the basis for which, on which we want to decide how contemplative pra practices should be brought into our societies, how they should be revived, is through the lens of science. And, the prob and there are problems with that. So what I want to do is read a quote. Uh, it's a little bit long, and it's not from a Buddhist. Uh, it's from a, a, a Catholic, uh, Thomas Merton. And it's something he wrote in the, in the late 60s. And he says, for the fathers, the desert fathers, the contemplatives of the early Christian church, discipline and ascesis were not simply surefire methods which paid off in results, provided you followed all the instructions and carried out all the proper steps in the right direction, in the right order. This concept of discipline in the life of prayer did, however, arise in the 15th and 16th century, about the same time as the concept of scientific method developed. The idea was, he writes, that if you set up the right conditions, a kind of laboratory for prayer, and if you carried out the experiment according to instructions, you would get the de desired result. You could work out things efficiently so that you obtained the precise kind of grace you were looking for. This concept had by now evolved into what he calls the simple pharmacology of contemplation. You take the right pill and you turn on. It tells you that it was written in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> hence, <clears throat> he goes on, he says, hence the idea of discipline was corrupted into a kind of methodology and instead of really praying and meditating, people became obsessed with their method and observed themselves at prayer, checking on the method and wondering why they were not getting the desired result. This transformation of a discipline in a broad human measure and in a theological climate of love and grace into a methodology of will and concentration has been fatal to Catholic uh, contemplation. 
you could say much the same story about what may be happening to certain aspects of Buddhist practice if we're not careful, despite what I just said about John kabat -Zinn. And my argument would be, <clears throat> well, my research background is, uh, like Jack was saying, I've worked in, in Tibetan Buddhist communities, particularly in Ladakh and the Northwestern Himalayas, for many years. And one reason why I began shifting my research to this field, partly because of biographical reasons, autobiographical reasons, <laughs> my own life, my own practice, and wishing to understand better you know, how these things can be brought together, but also because I saw in Ladakh a whole generation of young people for whom being Buddhist was more important perhaps than ever before in history because it was of the political mobilization against Kashmir. But these young people were coming to me and saying, what is Buddhism really? I mean, you know, what's the practice really? Because our parents, they just have blind faith. You know, it doesn't really speak to me. The lamas don't want to talk to us, really. Uh, they only know ritual. Where should we turn? And they started reading books written for Western audiences. And Tibetan lamas, Ladakhi lamas, uh, you know, were, were looking in part at the experiences that some of them, some of their colleagues had accumulated working in the West in order to get some ideas about how they might make the, the Dharma, the ways of practicing and understanding the Dharma more relevant for young people also in Asia. So what we're having is this really interesting looping effect where the Dharma has moved to the West, transformed in all sorts of different ways and is in a way flowing back again to Asia in new forms, including in this so-called secularized mindfulness form. So there are Western mindfulness teachers going to Bhutan to teach in schools Bhutanese children mindfulness. <laughs> and as His Holiness the Dalai Lama would say, well, if it brings benefit, how wonderful. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so one question we should ask, <laughs> keep track of the time. One question we should ask is, so how do we know, well, do we know enough about how to study and what it is that we should be studying? And of course, my answer will be no, because I just read you the quote from Thomas Merton. Because this pharmacological approach is basically saying, well, let's take everything apart and study ingredients one at a time and see how their interaction effects are with different things. This is how science works. I'm not saying that that shouldn't be going on. Of course it needs to be going on. It's a very important way forward, and it is the kind of research that has fed and fueled the um, proliferation of mindfulness so that you now can learn it in every village in Denmark, in evening courses, in the library, and, you know. And uh, as part of my, one of my other uh, identities, I'm involved in uh, developing and teaching um, uh, teachers to work with very basic kinds of methods, not mindfulness, but related kinds of things in schools, working with children. So what we really need is, in my opinion, is also to do something else. And that is to try and begin to look more carefully, partly on what the traditions have been doing in the past. And there we have textual scholars, and, but you know, the literature is it's, it's limited what, how you can use it in terms of understanding what actually was going on. What I think is, is equally or probably more important is to, because we've lost spiritual literacy in the sense of understanding what a contemplative life was and could be today. And the point is not to find the way of you know, contemplative life that's going to work for everybody, but to get a broader understanding of the different forms of contemplative life and what they're actually doing in people's lives. And what I mean what they're doing in people's lives is not how to perform on a behavioral test or another uh, you know, task that uh, a scientist pr gives them, but the ways in which they choose to live their lives. What kind of priorities? How are they going to be consuming? How do they treat other people? You know, where are they going to live? How are they going to live? Do they choose to get the second and the third and the fourth car and go on holiday three or four times a year by plane? Or do we simplify our lives? For me, um, I'm convinced that the kinds of crises that we're facing in our societies and globally cannot be solved by science alone, and it certainly cannot be solved by politicians alone. The changes have to come from people themselves, not because somebody tells them something, but because they can experience it for themselves. And that kind of change is slow, it's difficult, and science is involved, but we really need to begin to understand that a contemplative life is not a matter of 15 minutes in the evening where you're sitting on your pillow and trying to keep your attention on your breath. That's really good, and it's a form of contemplative life. But the breadth and the depth of the traditions 
really be, need to begin to be uh, described and explored in a much broader sense before we can more directly and effectively begin to study more scientifically the, the deeper mechanisms and so on that might also be involved in certain aspects of practice. So we need to go away from practices as individual ingredients in a contemplative arsenal or medicine kit to contemplative practice and contemplative life as a broader category. Thank you. Okay, well thank you everybody. Um, as you can see, people come from a wide range of backgrounds and have a wide range of concerns and uh, they're all basically pretty fascinating. Um, so um, let's just open it up for questions. We, as could be expected, have run a little late, but, but there's still plenty of time for questions. So, yes? I have a question to... Uh, shall we have people use the mics? I guess so. Um, we, so could we hand uh, this mic over? We have a couple around. We're recording this. That's why we're doing that. Uh, so uh, I have a question to uh, Mr. Sean. Uh, uh, the, the, he mentioned that uh, the person uh, who, he, how he will explain the uh, once he is, he how he will explain the fullness. Once the once he is reached to the fullness, and then he goes out, and then uh, once he comes back, how he will explain. So uh, on that, my comment is that uh, once the person reached to that point and come back, he will have answer how he can explain. That, that's what I feel. Uh, and, and he will take exactly where we have to go. Uh, that, that I believe. Uh, second thing is, uh, I have a question to you. You explained that uh, the person, <laughs> let's say someone, uh, um, the musician, or some, someone who, who has mind mindfulness, right? He experienced. But can we have, like those are, those are the best people in the world right now. Those musicians are the best. But for the common man's life, he must have, in his life, he must have feel the mindfulness. So what is the example where we can explain easily what is the mindfulness in common man's life? OK, very nice uh, questions. Yeah, so I don't, uh, I haven't, I, I don't have the answer to, to the, the first part where uh, if you have someone go into this selfless state uh, and then come back out and then they they give us a description, um, that's quite possible. Now the question is, how does that happen? How 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 does that work? Um, and being in the, the selfless state, uh, how you know what does that description somehow or other capture the selflessness of it? If in fact there's a report of it, uh, which seems to imply that the, uh, uh, the person was there to experience it. So that's the, the kind of paradoxical bit of it. Uh, but I, I don't want to uh, say I know the answer. I don't know the answer. Uh, but that, that's sort of what I would like to investigate. Uh, and in terms of um, mindfulness for the common man, <laughs> um, well, um, I'm not an expert on that. Um, I, uh, I practice a little bit of mindfulness, uh, and I'm not an expert on mindfulness uh, in, in practice either. And uh, perhaps it's uh, the John Kabat-Zinn uh, version uh, for, for the masses, or uh, perhaps every individual has to find their own way to it. Um, but uh, if, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I can say anything more about that. Well, could, could I just, the Chan Zen text would say, and there's different interpretations in different schools of Buddhism, that everyone has moments, you know, these aspire to moments. So in certain schools of Buddhism, it's really long path, really hard. Other schools, they'll say, you experience it maybe just momentarily, right? I mean, Zen tries to de-exoticize the goal. So the common man and woman are also Buddhas, right, in certain schools of Buddhist thought. And it might be that you, you could find it uh, in playing music or dancing also. It might just be whatever it is that you do uh, where you might find it. OK. Thank you. 
draw these generalizations about science. Um, does anybody ever talk about uh, scientific discovery? Elena, shall we? You're our token scientist here, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a long history um, of anecdotes in science whereby things that led to fundamental discoveries or advances have come out of what we call lived experience rather than being in the lab. You know, uh, mathematicians um, use four, was it, was it four, four Bs, bed, bed, bath, bus, or is it three Bs? Are you, are you familiar? Bed, bath. <laughs> Basically, it's, it's three Bs, three Bs of, of scientific breakthrough, right? So bed, bed, bath, or bus. Meaning you have to disengage from the linear cognitive effortful thinking. You know, you struggle to solve a certain problem. But at some point you need to disengage and open your field of awareness. And that's when you have your eureka moment. So, you know, of course we have um, uh, you know, spe special relativity came to Einstein when he was sort of sitting in the train and one train passing, you know, and, and the whole, you know, that was his moment of aha, which then evolved into a whole theory um, supported by mathematical model and we have, you know, wonderful technological implications of that. Uh, and there are other stories. I, I can't remember the name of the um, scientist slash engineer out of which um, television emerged. But, but he was gazing onto the fields outside of uh, the, the house he was in and the field was being plowed and that sort of you know, looking at that parallel <laughs> um, field of kind of parallel vision gave him an idea that then got trans transposed into what we now consider, you know, we all have to have in our living room and a bedroom and the kitchen um, <laughs> for some of us. So um, the, there are, then, you know, numerous anecdotes. I am not going to go through them all, but what they all point to is that uh, scientific discovery happens in the same moments of open awareness, of being connected to the lived experience. So again, there isn't much contradiction. We make it so, but there isn't as much. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. scientists or research or observer have to have that a similar level of uh, refinement in his uh, mind to understand it. Okay. The, conversely, if the scientist or the observer uh, doesn't have that, how, I, I would imagine it's kind of difficult for the, for the person who is research to really understand what the Yeah. So in, uh, in the, uh, one of the more famous studies in neurophenomenology, uh, where Francisco Varela did, uh, was involved in the study, um, the subjects uh, of the study were, in fact, the scientists. And they had engaged in a practice of uh, the, pr the practice of the methodology of phenomenology. Now, it seems to me that <clears throat> you could have the same kind of arrangement uh, of someone, uh, and in fact, uh, Francisco also was a meditator, so you could have uh, a meditator uh, who uh, engages in the experiment uh, also be the scientist. I mean, that seems possible. Most scientists, I think, are not like that, although I think we have one here, so maybe she would be in a better position <laughs> to, to actually answer that question. Uh, do you, you want to? Uh, 
Um, Talk to it. Well, uh, I, I guess what I'm, that's what I sort of mean by the practice of groundlessness in, in the sense that constantly being aware when you're slipping into this reification, you know, there's no, nothing wrong with us using the methodologies that we have. There's nothing wrong with extending our senses by using microscopes and fMRI machines and hydrogen colliders and whatever else at our disposal. Uh, but we don't necessarily have to slip into this error that Buddhists point out to when we reify the subject, subject out here, observing the objective world out there. You know, we, we kind of know enough by now to know this is a source of <laughs> confusion and suffering. So there's nothing wrong with, you know, there are many methods like um, Sean was talking about uh, continental phenomenology and the father of it, Husserl, and he uh, was practicing the method of epoche, you know, relaxing the, what he called, naive attitude, um, or, the, uh, sorry, natural attitude, or, or what we call naive realism. You know, we all, unless we're practicing, unless we're aware of it and we snap out of it, we all live in the mode of naive realism perceptually, right? There are objects out there and there's me in here, perceives the objects out there and, and so, so the story goes. And that's what an average scientist would do. Um, but there are ways to make the subtle shift by applying whatever technique, you know, epoche, mindfulness, just knowing what the science ideal is as opposed to being a you know, proponent of scientism and just say, okay, hold on, I just, I can use the same methods, I can go, I can walk the same path, but I can just snap out of it and make the subtle shift. There, yeah. In, in, in that sense, I think micro phenomenology seems to provide a really nice uh, methodology frame today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can I just uh, speak to it? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> I mean, the way I understood the question was, in a way, whether we need to be familiar. How, how familiar do we need to be with the phenomena that we're studying? And of course, an anthropology would say, well, if you really want to understand what it's like to go to be a fisherman, you go fishing, and you spend a year or two <laughs> fishing, and then you know what it's like. And it's, I think, the same applies to a certain extent uh, where it's possible, also for contemplative practice. So ideally, you want to have interlocutors who can explain in different kinds of ways the kinds of practices that they're engaging in, the kinds of phenomena that, that, you know, that you're interested in, um, which is one of the reasons. And it's ideal that the scientist has enough of a conceptual and practical understanding of the practice um, that she can have this dialogue in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in an easy way. I think one of the problems uh, with, with some of the earlier research also uh, in meditation is that um, either people were studying, you know, very uh, obscure uh, <laughs> phenomena, or what happens a lot in, in, standard, in standard scientific research is that we draw on the things that we are familiar with. So we say, well, it's, it's, it, it sounds a bit like that. Why don't we assume it's like that and check? And I think one of the things that I was trying to say with, with, um, with the importance of looking uh, more broadly uh, at contemplative life is that um, we really have no idea what we're dealing with to a much greater extent than I think we think. Um, and so for that, so in terms of the kinds of phenomena that you're talking about, uh, one of Varela's projects was, and one of the things that the Mind and Life Institute is promoting, is the um, um, fostering a generation of scientists like Elena who have extensive uh, contemplative experience so that the kind of questions that the scientists bring to the dialogue are more uh, appropriate, you could say, in the kinds of understandings we bring. Uh, and that's also produces certain tension, if I can just say, because uh, our colleagues then criticize us for the lack of objectivity. You know, their argument is to study uh, the effect of mindfulness uh, on the brain level or phy physiological system objectively. You, you, have no, you, don't, you don't need to be, or you even prohibit it from being a practitioner yourself because it's kind of an introduces a confirmatory bias, right? You're trying to prove what you believe in. But, you know, my answer to that is um, it, it's, if you are uh, an objective scientist who has no experience of meditation, you, 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 like a blind person, trying to design an experiment in visual neuroscience and visual perception. I mean, it's just... <laughs> It, it is something experiential, therefore, there has to be an experiential understanding 
of what you are studying. And the, I think in this case too that uh, it's this is part of what we're talking about in our in our uh, ten day workshop. Um, but uh, you might think that uh, well, this particular type of thing that we're trying to study is requires uh, special methods, uh, and maybe you could think of it as a kind of participatory science where the people we're studying are are also in a certain way contributing to the science in a kind of direct way as they report on their experience. Okay, so we have uh, one, two, three like this, okay? Right. Uh, I guess I, I'm just wondering about, it's almost like the antithesis of the um, scientific method, but a teacher once told me if you want to really be able to see clearly, assume what you're experiencing or seeing is true, and then go back and you know uh, examine it. But by not seeing it or taking it as the truth, I'm limiting everything, uh, all my information going forward, and, and with a negative film on it. So my, my question is, is there, because it's not the scientific method, but there, are there any research studies going on that would take the phenomena, assuming it is, or is anybody defining what that experience might be, and then just assuming that's true and cultivating that knowledge from the participants and then trying, I'm trying to think of the word D, um, you know, instead of prove it from nothing, take it and kind of disprove it then, going the opposite direction. Am I being clear at all or not? <laughs> um, would you give okay, an example so of phenomena? Like the science of, I'm talking about, oh, let's just say experiences or when we talk about mm -hmm. selfless, uh, mm -hmm. you know, those states or um, to start with the selfless experience, as assume that that's real mm -hmm. right off the bat, okay. to assume that it is not defined by certain criteria and then investigate what that is. So it's kind of from the top down instead of the bottom up. Well, in, in a way you could say that, that the microphenomenological or phenomenology in general in a way starts from experience. So, so one of the things you can do is, is do a rigorous investigation of the experience and help people sort of formulate more clearly what it is that they're, what, what's happening, what they're doing uh, you know, how it begins, how it ends, whether it has color, whether it, you know, what, what dimensions it has. Um, so that kind of, but, but that's not mainstream science. Yeah, it's but, not mainstream, yeah. and I'm wondering if anybody's doing it, though. But, but this well, is it's science is a, as a kind of enterprise, right? Uh, and as formulated by uh, people like Kuhn, is, is the practice of falsification. So you are taking something, this is how it is, um, and or you have a hypothesis about how things are, and hypothesis has to be potentially falsifiable. So science is never proving, it's looking for the ways to falsify a certain statement, a certain hypothesis. Um, okay, I, I think the distinction is clear. Okay. Jack, is it on? It is on, okay. Um, this question may be the last question because it's for everyone and it's personal. It may take 10 minutes. <laughs> what I'm interested from each of you is what is motivating you to do the work you're doing? For example, is it to reduce suffering in the world? Is it to increase kindness in the world? Is it to increase mindfulness or skillful means? Is it your desire to make a more positive or to make a positive contribution to society? Can everyone hear me? <laughs> well, we heard you. <laughs> a teacher's voice. <laughs> um, okay, well, I, I can, you know, it's always a little difficult to talk about intention because you can do it at so many different levels. Mm -hmm. But I, I am a practicing Buddhist, and um, for me what matters is to um, be of benefit 
to people in the world, to all sentient beings, but I tend to focus a lot on people uh, in, my, in my thinking. Um, and um, I think that Buddhism is a wisdom tradition that has a whole lot to offer. So my way of trying to be a benefit to people in the world is to uh, make available in different contexts and in different uh, areas of investigation uh, the wisdom of the Buddhist tradition. Uh, I'll, I'll be very quick. I'm fundamentally an educator. I'm a professor. I teach undergraduates, you know, um, by far the most. I, I mean, I have some graduate students. So I, I would say my goal is to teach them Buddhism history content, but the lesson would be the comfort of living with multiplicity and uncertainty. Right. Uh, well, I don't like people, so I don't really care if I help anybody. <laughs> no, I'm, only, I'm only kidding. Uh, but I, I think my motivation is, uh, is more intellectual. It's more about trying to understand, trying to really understand the, the phenomenon. That's why I'm a phenomenologist. <laughs> and uh, that's that's my if and if I help people, uh, I don't know how that would happen, but uh, that would be fine too. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's very multi-layered, but to make it brief, um, I would say that uh, my personal experience of practice and my personal encounter with Buddhism uh, has been very helpful and transformational. So, for me. Um, Science is a medium through which I could reach others to put it on the table as an offering, um, because science became a you know a religion in our Western society, um, and so it's a very powerful medium to communicate. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> um, I I I try and. Uh, so, so his own the Dalai Lama has this simple definition of Buddhism that he uses in the West, where he says, um, if you can help, help. If you can't help, at least try not to do any harm. And that's, that's how I try and live my life. Um, the other uh, thing that I'm trying to figure out is how to strike the balance or how to integrate um, what was in the old contemplative traditions in, in, in the Christian tradition seen as a tension between the vita contemplativa and the vita activa, so the active life and the contemplative life. And for me, it's a false opposition. But, but, but how, um, how to integrate those different aspects of life, so the contemplative dimension more, in a more narrow sense, and one's engagement with the world and making positive contributions, I think it's a puzzle for everyone to solve for themselves. I don't think anybody can come with, well, you can come with a, uh, you know, this is what you should do, but I don't think it works that way. I think people need to figure it out for themselves. And I, I try and do that in my own way, uh, with this aspiration. I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the methods that I develop because uh, they help us become aware of what we don't see. And so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I do need the microphone because I don't have a teacher's voice, I have a therapist's voice. <laughs> <laughs> As I've often been reminded. So I'm remembering um, a very powerful experience for me, much younger, reading Suzuki for the first time. And as I remember it, a distinction he made between what he called loosely the Western way of knowing and the Eastern way of knowing, a flower. Um, and everybody probably has completed that sentence for me. That, um, as I remember it, the, East, the Western way is to dissect it, look at it under the microscope, do a chemical analysis, etc., And the Eastern way is to observe the flower where it is and to get to know the flower. So what I'm struggling with in, in listening um, is related to that. So I'm drawn to the descriptions of microphenomenology, for instance, that you give, because 
it seems so powerful to really drill down on the detail and try to really fully understand that moment. Um, the beach example was very powerful for me and it evoked all kinds of memories of what the deep experiences in meditation are. The description of scientific discovery is interesting. The Einstein story, or the one that I always remember, is I think it's Kekulé who was trying to discover benzene and knew it had six mm -hmm. carbon atoms, but had a dream supposedly in which he saw six monkeys chasing each other and grabbing each other's tail, and that's how he discovered the ring. So those are interesting to me, but I worry about the bias of that kind of selectivity out of context. And, and I, I worry about the unintended consequence, going back to Suzuki, of looking at these moments outside of context. So for instance, is it really true that Einstein made that discovery at the moment of the trains? What about all the tectonic plate movement that had happened before that, all of the study, all of the context that was in place before that moment? And the same for the depth of analysis of that particular instant in meditation. I mean, when I think about the beach, it's what happened for me before and after, because you were referencing that. So what I worry about is the unintended consequence, particularly as it might derive from the fact that I or most of us have a Western orientation that we come at all of this with, for starters. And so I then get trapped in how to um, context to dependent origination, I'm sorry, to, to really seeing things in their non-dualistic nature and not get so absorbed in the explicit that we miss the surround. I'd be interested in any of your responses about how you think that plays out in the work that you do. understand your concern, uh, two things. One is that if we contrast West and East in that manner, we we're ignoring a large part of Western history, which may not be the dominant one, mm -hmm. but it's there. And it still exists, uh, particularly in the Eastern Orthodox. In the Orthodox Church, there is still a, a, a rich contemplative tradition. Um, and in science also, there is a, you know, the ecological perspective, systems perspective, and so on. So, so not, that's one thing. The other thing, in the Buddhist tradition, there is also a great tradition, as we've uh, <laughs> been reminded of through these five days, of making long lists in extreme detail about, <laughs> right? So, so, so one has to be careful. The concern that you're raising, um, I recognize. Um, and with microphenomenology, the power of the method is exactly to help people become aware in a very, vi <laughs> very fine-grained manner of aspects of their inner life that otherwise remain um, unconscious, which may be beneficial, it might also not be beneficial in some contexts. But that's not the privileged, the privileged method for everything. So, so with all these, uh, with, like, with, sometimes this is seen as, um, you know, the, 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 the attempts at dialogue are sometimes seen as, a, as a, an inevitable confrontation of worldviews and methods, and we can't, you know, really agree, and we've been at it for five days, and we're all very sympathetic to the project, and, you know, but still there is this sense of attention that keeps emerging. And for me, in part, that is, um, you know, much of it for me, <laughs> it's a question of context. Where do we need to apply which kinds of methods in order to get knowledge that is useful and beneficial for solving certain kinds of questions. 
And science is extremely powerful and efficient for certain kinds of uh, ways of doing, uh, yeah. ways of knowing, as a way of knowing and getting, getting at knowledge. But the ways in which science um, is practiced might be extended. Um, and the, 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 yeah, so, so, so there are other kinds of ways of knowing that might inform science and, uh, and that are useful in other kinds of contexts. And as we all know, we don't live by the, let's say, economic. Nobody lives like the economists believe that we operate, right? Except economists when, you know. But they don't live like that in their personal life. So, so there are always these paradoxes, and I think it's partly a matter of, of remembering that I don't think any of us, you know, Elena wouldn't say that, well, if everybody became a neuroscientist in her version, then the world would become a better place and, and all problems would be solved. And the same would be true, I'm sure, for, for Sean, although phenomenologists really are wonderful people. I mean, some of my best friends are phenomenologists. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and Francesca's uh, Buddhist scholarship it is, I mean, genuine, I'm not, you know, like, it, it really is of benefit to many people. Um, so, but nobody would say, you know, if only everybody would study uh, Buddhist studies, then every, all, all our problems would be solved. We'd, we'd still need engineers to provide us water and ele electricity or shelter. Mm -hmm. So it's contextual. Hmm. Okay, it is 9 o'clock, um, so I'll call it late <coughs> for, for this now. Um, I do want to mention one thing, which is um, next Sunday, so in nine days, we're going to be having another open panel discussion that will be on a very different um, topic and with very different presenters who is also at the, it comes at the tail end of a three-day conference that we're doing and the theme of that conference is uh, mindfulness and social justice mm -hmm. and so some of the presenters are academics but some of them are practitioners um, and and uh, one of the particular emphases is uh, people of, of Asian American heritage and and how they're dealing with with mindfulness as it impacts their communities. So um, you're all invited, of course, to come to that. I don't remember whether it starts at 2 or 3 in the afternoon, but uh, just so you know. And generally, Mangalam Center, uh, we're trying to move more towards a, a more public face where we have programs of different kinds on a um, you know, an, an, an off and on basis. I mean, we don't have a firm schedule, but we will be doing more events. So if by any strange chance you're not on the uh, our mailing list, uh, please be sure that you are so that you can find out about these things. Okay, but thank you very much, and thank you to our panelists. <laughs>